Most of us walk around every day dragging our chains around. Even if we think God has saved us, we often worry about whether we've done enough or do enough to please Him. We weigh ourselves down or others put more weight on us to do better, try harder, do these things, don't do these things. It's exhausting and can lead to feelings of despair or pride if we're really one of those good people. But the gospel can free us in every way, in every aspect. The good news of Jesus Christ frees us to live with confidence in the midst of uncertainty, brings unity in the midst of strife, and delivers joy in the midst of suffering. There's no other gospel like it. Good morning, Redemption. I'm Jeff Kirby. I'm a spring volunteer as well as an elder here at the church. This morning I'll be reading from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. That's page 701 in the church Bibles if you want to join along with me. Paul is talking to the church of Galatians. In verse 11 he starts with the following. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have got, excuse me, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Well, good morning. If you've got a Bible or an electronic device, why don't you open up to what you just heard read. We're going to be working our way through that this morning. Galatians chapter 2, as Jeff told you, if you don't have one, grab a church Bible around you. It is on page 701 in those Bibles. Well, I I don't know how many of you remember, especially some of the older uh, folks in the crowd, the 1986 Converse commercial. It's kind of a big deal in our area of the state because it was shot and filmed in French Lick, Indiana features this opening of this limousine going the back roads of Indiana and suddenly appears at Larry Bird's estate uh, in front of his uh, outdoor court. Window rolls down. It's Magic Johnson who looks out the window and challenges Larry Bird to a game of one-on-one. They'd been the previous two years MVPs of the NBA. Magic gets out and they show off their brand new Converse sneakers. Kind of a cool commercial. Uh, But what you might not know was there was a lot going on behind the scenes of that commercial. In fact, if you've maybe seen the Bird and Magic documentary, uh, it gives you a little bit of of what was really going on. Those two, beyond being rivals on the court, uh, were enemies. They actually hated each other, had no speaking relationship. Converse had to do a lot of work just to get them to appear in a commercial together. So you can imagine that opening morning of the first day of the shoot, uh, it was awkward for everyone including those two, because they really didn't want to talk. They really didn't want to interact with one another, which was what the whole commercial was based on. But all of that changed when they broke for their first lunch break during the shoot. 
In fact, right at then, as Magic began to kind of go off to do his own thing for lunch, Bird grabbed him and informed him that his mom had made dinner, uh, had made lunch, and that he was invited. And it was there at a table much like this that their relationship completely changed. In fact, Larry Bird in his own words said, it was at that table that I discovered Irvin Johnson. That's Magic's real name. He said, I I'd never liked Magic Johnson much, but Irvin I liked a lot. And Irvin didn't come out until we sat at my mom's table. And they've been friends ever since. Now, now, I share that story with you because if Larry's mom would have been around 2,000 years ago to show some Hoosier hospitality in the early church, we might have avoided one of the most awkward episodes in all of the New Testament, all around opponents, all around enemies, not wanting to eat together. That's what we're going to be working our way through this morning. Now, before we get there, let me kind of back up real quick and help you understand where we are in Galatians in this No Other Gospel series we've been in. If you're around, in week one, we, we discovered that we call this the book of Galatians, but it's actually a letter written from the Apostle Paul to some churches in this region of what is now modern-day Turkey called Galatia. And Paul's writing because there was these uh, Jewish Christians, this group of them called the Judaizers, that had come onto the scene after he had founded these churches, and they had begun spreading a message contrary to the gospel of Christ. For them, salvation happened by following Jesus plus following the Jewish ceremonial laws, and that's how you got saved in uh, you got saved as a Christian in fact namely of their concerns was they believed the Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised that was the thing that they needed to do and the only way that they could get Christians to buy into this and, and to actually follow through with this was to discredit the first messenger that they had heard who was the Apostle Paul and his message of coming to Jesus by grace alone in faith alone and that's why last week, Daryl had to work our way through the rest of chapter one when we saw Paul kind of tell his own story, not only of his own transformation in Christ, but that he talks about the fact that his message was divinely received from Christ to, uh, to himself. He didn't come up with this. In fact, he tells us 14 years after his conversion, when he finally meets up with the rest of the apostles, he finds out that they've all been preaching the same exact message without influencing one another. It had come directly from Christ. That leads us to where we are this morning. Paul's going to continue, actually finish up kind of this autobiographical section of the letter. And he's going to do so by bringing our attention to an episode that is the linchpin of his argument. It's that he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Apostle Peter, the rock, the guy at the middle of uh, being the genesis of New Testament Christianity, and Paul won. And it's that victory that would leave the Judaizers with little ground to stand on. So we're going to work our way through that. We're going to break it down. We're going to help you understand a little bit of what's going on. And then I hope we can connect this to your life so that you can understand why this is so important to us thousands of years later. And we're going to start that by first understanding the conflict. That, that's kind of the whole, the whole idea is what we heard read earlier from, from Jeff is uh, the central theme to this story is conflict. In fact, look back there with me, starting in verse 11, we see Paul describe it for us. He says this, But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised, but afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. You can pause there. So he, here's kind of the rundown of what's going on. All this takes place in Antioch. This was a part of, this, this was a part of the region of Galatia. And we, we don't really get a whole lot from this, but this really honestly was known as Little Rome. It was a metropolitan area. All the Caesars had poured lots of money into it to make it a big deal. Uh, they had an arena, a, a library, they had a theater, things that we kind of take for granted, but in the ancient world were really big deals. So a lot of people had relocated there. Uh, they had attracted a lot of diversity in Antioch. And so most scholars agree that the church in Antioch was like 50-50 Jew-Gentile. Both and. There was a lot of Jews in Antioch, but they were far from the only people present in the church. We also read here that Peter is present at this time. This was like the forefront of the expansion. It was the frontier of the expansion of Christianity at the time. And Paul's present as well, and things seem to be going well. And then 
they seem to kind of go south. Now, it's a little bit hard to pick up there, but if you can read this in Greek, the Greek tense kind of makes it clear to us that at first Paul is present, and then he kind of goes somewhere else. We, we don't know exactly where he went. You could maybe uh, rummage around in Acts and maybe surmise that he's on some of the outlying cities and towns from Antioch preaching the gospel. But when he's first there, before he leaves, Jews and Gentiles are mingling, they're eating together, they're sitting and sharing, ta- uh, sharing meals together, at tables together, they're interacting on a, a level that says we have unity in Christ, we are one, we are on the same level in Christ Jesus. But when he returns, he walks in on this like high school cafeteria scene. Instead of like jocks and nerds, you have Jews and Gentile, kosher and non-kosher, Hebrew national and Oscar Mayer. That's kind of the, the breakdown of what's going on here. And Peter's right in the middle of it. He's done the exact same. Peter is no longer eating with the Gentiles. He's only eating with the Jews. Now, th- this could get lost on us a little bit because eating together is kind of a lost art in our culture. The table here is no longer a critical component to our way of life. In fact, I I just was reading a couple of weeks ago that uh, now statistically the average American eats more meals in their car per week than they do around a table with other folks. It's a little bit different than most of the cultures of the world still today, and historically, basically every culture. The table is the center point of life. That's the culture in Galatians. You have a culture that is built on the relationships that are happening around a piece of furniture just like this. Dinner was slow. It was methodic. It was well thought out. This was a culinary culture, and so to eat with someone was more than just hanging out. It was more than just getting some protein. It carried with it social and cultural implications that we just don't see in our culture today. So that's why when Paul walks in and he sees this going on, it's a really big deal. He realized this projects to the much larger issue that these believers from different ethnic backgrounds don't have unity. They don't see themselves as one with Christ. So he walks in and he goes and he confronts the character most at the center of all of it, the Apostle Peter. He realizes Peter has the ability to sway the entire room. In fact, he tells us he already had. Look with me at verse 13. It says, as a result of what Peter was doing, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas, one of Paul's homeboys, was led astray by their hypocrisy. See, at one point, Peter had been willing to sit and eat with the Gentiles as though they were his peers, as though they were equal with him as a Jew. He was willing to eat a non-kosher diet. He was willing to walk in the freedom that he had found with Christ, which meant eating with people of other ethnic backgrounds who no longer held to his uh, dietary restrictions, according to the historical law. Then these friends of James show up. They, They believe that circumcision has to to be there for unity. In fact, some translations call them the circumcision party. A terrible name for a group, but that's what they're called. And he's no longer eating with them. Now, that that should make us question Paul uh, enough as it is, right? I mean, who goes back to restricting pork after they've had it? I mean, for me personally, I'm staying at the bacon-pulled pork table myself, but Paul, uh, Peter doesn't. He pulls back and others follow suit. So confronting Peter literally means addressing this issue of unity with everyone that is present in the room. That's what Paul does. And then his message is pretty critical in that, which is the second thing I want you to get, the critical point. Once Paul walks in, sees the scene, he he addresses Peter in front of everyone, what he calls Peter out for is different than we might think what he's calling Peter, uh, Peter out for. Look with me at verse 14. It says, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are now living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles, yet you know, yet you know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not obeying the law. And we now have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. You hear what he's saying? Paul's beef with Peter is not his belief, but his behavior. In fact, of all people to have to give this message to, Peter was quite aware of the message Paul was reminding him about here. In fact, it's really ironic that Paul's having to remind Peter about this at all for multiple reasons. 
for starters. It's kind of ironic Paul's having to bring this up because Peter was in the middle of the very first Gentiles being brought into the fold of Christianity. Well, over in Acts chapter 10, which is kind of like the Acts is the history book of the early church, there we read Peter was right in the middle of all this drama with Jews and Gentiles. There we read about this, this Gentile, this guy named Cornelius of Caesarea. He's not a Jew. He's what they call a god fear. He believes in God. He prays. He gives his alms to the poor. And one day while he's praying, an angel of the Lord shows up to him and says, hey, send some of your men to Joppa. And there in Joppa at this man named Simon the Tanner's house, there's a guy there named Simon Peter. Bring him to you for he has a message you need to hear. Well, simultaneously of all these events going on, Simon Peter is actually on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house and he begins to have a vision. It's this vision of this, this blanket, the sheep being rolled out from heaven and in it are all these uh, unclean animals, uh, all these what we would call common animals, can, animals that they were not supposed to touch or eat as Jewish people. And there three times, it's in red letters, it's Jesus speaking to him, Jesus says, kill and eat. And Peter denies three times. And I find that really funny. That's kind of Peter's MO. He's always denying three times. He does it there as well. And then he wakes up and he wonders, why in the world am I having this vision? Right then and there, the doorbell rings. The boys from Cornelius' house have arrived. And they're there to say, hey, we, an angel of the Lord showed up. You need to come and talk to this guy. And when Peter finally gets to Caesarea and he gets to this home, the light bulb goes on as to what God is doing and he preaches to this unclean gentile and his family uh, listen to what happens it's gonna be on the screen it said even as peter was saying these things the holy spirit fell on all who were listening to the message the jewish believers who came with peter were amazed that the gift of the holy spirit had been poured out on the gentiles too for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising god then peter asked can anyone object to their being baptized now that they've received the holy spirit just as we did so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of jesus christ afterward cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days pretty funny huh peter actually baptized the first gentiles and he stayed and he ate with them he's literally living out a fulfillment of a promise that goes all the way back to the abrahamic covenant in the old testament it goes back to a promise god gives eve in genesis chapter 3 that he was going to work in this manner peter gets to see it come true that there's no longer a divide between Jew and Gentile. It has been broken. Even funnier, a chapter later, some kind of idiotic Jewish believers call Peter out for this. And what does Peter do? He turns and he preaches to them as well. He literally says, hey, the Holy Spirit fell, you morons. Like, what do you want me to do? Tell the Holy Spirit he can't do that. Who am I to argue with God? Now, that's not an exact translation, but that's basically what, what happens. Peter has already fought this fight once before. It's kind of ironic that he's having to be reminded of it. It's also ironic that Paul's having to remind Peter of this because he sat at the feet of Jesus for three years. Jesus, the, the dude who got called out by the Pharisees for what? Eating with sinners. Jesus knew that change came through relationship, not by ostracizing people. Namely, it didn't just come through any relationship, but relationship, a connection to him. And so even if these Gentile believers had been wrong, which by the way, they were not, but even if they had been, Peter had no business recusing himself and not having fellowship with him. In doing so, he was insinuating that their behavior was of first importance and that they could save themselves apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, when we get these two things, it's a game changer. We begin to understand the critical point that Paul is trying to make. He knows Peter already knows the gospel message and how it relates to Gentiles. What he's frustrated with him about is that he's acting in a way that is contrary to what he knows to be true. His beliefs are different than his behavior. His rhetoric is different than his ritual here. His convictions are different than his conduct, a.k.a. he's being hypocritical. He actually says that in the text. You're, you're being hypocritical. He calls him out for not following or living out the truth of the gospel message, or some translations put it, not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Now, this is important for us to get because Paul's going to do some teaching in these final verses, and it could sound a little condescending. But this is not for Peter. This is really for the others. And it's not something Peter didn't already know. Peter already believed the marvelous, incredible message of Galatians chapter 2. 
uh, chapter 2, verse 20, that my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, so that I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who has loved me and gave himself for me. Peter believed that. He knew that. Peter knew that the law system couldn't justify someone or make them right with God. If so, as Paul will go on to say a verse later in verse 21, there would be no need for Christ to die. Peter knew all of that, but his actions spoke a different message. His actions, regardless of motive, gave the impression that these others needed something else more than Christ for salvation. He was projecting another gospel with his life. Man, Proverbs 13, 10 tells us, where there is strife, there is pride. Where there is division, it always comes back to pride, or at least the appearance of it. That's Peter's problem. That's his cohort's problem, and that is what Paul is calling out him on. That is the critical point. In fact, I really believe that this text was written, Galatians was written before Acts chapter 15, the great council of Jerusalem, where Peter will fight for the Gentiles and will actually, him and the early church leaders will send out letters to all those churches in the known world telling Gentile believers that they have freedom in Christ. Paul was right, and he calls them out on it in this critical point. Which leads me to the last thing we really gotta get. When we get the conflict, when we see it, and we get the critical point Paul is making here, then we have to get the connection. This connects to our lives. Those, those things, thousands of years later, they connect to us. This passage is so applicable to us, our lives and our churches as well. Because Peter's mistake is so oftentimes the mistake we make as well. What is that mistake? That we, believe, that we claim to believe in the grace of Jesus being for all people, and then we live as if it's only for some good people. Can I say that again? We claim to believe that the grace of Jesus is for all people, and then we live as if it's only for some good people. I, I mean, I've been in some pretty legalistic old school churches in my life, and all of them claim that Jesus saves us. All of them know the message of John 3.16. That God so loved the world that he gave his son. They all have decision times every single week offering the free gift of salvation for people to accept it. But if you spend much time with them, you begin to see that they project another message, another gospel with their lives. It's part of the reason when you, you look around and you, you see these churches, you see that they're full of people who all look the same, who all dress the same, who all act the same, and all similarly dislike people who sin differently than they do. They claim to believe that Jesus is for all people, but they're giving an impression, their actions are giving another sermon altogether that it's Jesus plus something else equals salvation. And church, I don't want that to be us as well. Which leads me to a connecting question I want to ask you this morning, one that I want you to mull over and chew on this week because I think it has rather large implications about how you live your life. It's just simply this. Who aren't you eating with? Who, who aren't you eating with? Who, who, like Peter, are you giving the impression that you're better than them, that they need to do something beyond Jesus to be righteous or to be good or to be acceptable to you? After singing about Jesus' grace every week and about hearing it declared week after week, being enough for everybody on Sunday mornings, is there someone or someones you don't have fellowship with that you've acted better than rather than as a recipient of the free gift of salvation yourself? that you've not welcomed here to the table of the Lord. And for some of us, honestly, this means acting even like Peter did in seemingly polite, well-mannered ways. That we sit by those other people in church, but then we don't really eat with them. Well, we really don't become friends with them. We don't socialize with them. We don't share our lives and our homes and our things with them. Who is that for you? Who won't you eat with? If you're drawing blanks this morning, let me maybe help you out. There's a famous preacher, a British preacher in the 19th century named Charles Spurgeon, maybe the best writer of sermons of all time. And he, he suggests this. He says, be not proud of race of face, place, or grace. I think it's those four things are oftentimes the fault lines for us, the dividing factors for who we will or will not eat with, who we will or will not have fellowship with. And it's those things I think we got to die to if we are truly, truly going to have unity in the gospel as we should. 
In fact, let, let me break those down just a little bit. First is that of race. You know, oftentimes we find our uh, ethnic identity is the way that we distinguish ourselves or make ourselves feel better than other people. We take pride in these things as making us who we really are and who someone else is not. We take pride in our Americanness and our whiteness and our blackness and our Asianness and our Indian culture, our Hispanicness, or whatever. We use a racial distinction to make people who they are and to form divisions in identity. In fact, I love how J.D. preacher J.D. Greer says it. He says, you know, our cultures are beautiful things. They're created by God like a multi-sided diamond to reflect the glory of God. But whenever they become our primary identity, it always causes division and it always causes issues. And this has multiple implications for us. Some of us, this is within the confines of our country with some of the racial tensions that exist. For some of us, it's the global the idea that we have the sin of nationalism and we think we're just a little bit better because we're American. And Paul's going to tell us, man, that <laughs> we, we couldn't be more in the wrong. I love Romans chapter 10. Paul tells us that it does not matter. Every race, every ethnicity is in need of the same grace from Jesus Christ. There is no boasting. He's going to go on later, a chapter later in Galatians chapter 3, and tell us that after we've come to Christ, that is now our primary identity above anything else. He literally says, there is now no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for we are one in Christ Jesus. That is our new identity. Anything else is wrong. I love the way African-American preacher Tony Evans says it. He says the racial application to Paul's teaching here in Galatians 2 is that it is technically incorrect to say I'm a black Christian or I'm a white Christian because now you've made black and white the adjectives and Christian a noun. And if you know English at all, you know the job of an adjective is to modify the noun. So now you've got to keep Christian looking like the adjective that describes it or it ceases to be Christian. Instead, what we should be saying is, I'm a Christian who just so happens to be white. I'm a Christian who just so happens to be black. I'm a Christian who just happens to be an American. I'm a Christian who just happens to be Jewish. It is now, Christian is now our primary identity in Christ. It should far outweigh any ethnic differences or cultural distinctions we want to make. We are now Christ people. We are now kingdom people, having crucified our whiteness or our blackness or our Americanness or our Jewishness on the cross and declaring them as worthless in comparison to the riches of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is the gospel message. And so I want to ask you this morning, don't amen it, don't amen it, do you have a place at the table for, for other races? Do you? Do they have a place card where they're invited in your midst to have fellowship with you, to sit around your table and to be a part of your life? What about face? What about face? For some of us, we like to think personal accomplishments or characteristics set us apart or make us better or more worthy than others. I mean, it's one of the most sinful things we often do. I'm as guilty of it as anybody else. We tend to categorize people by very external qualities. They're successful or unsuccessful. They're intelligent or they're dull. They're beautiful or they're ugly. They're fit, they're fat, they're rich, they're poor. And so we look down on those that are less than us in those categories, and we oftentimes feel intimidated by those who are more so in those categories. Even in the church, we battle this all the time. Working class Christians can oftentimes have a distaste for Christians who are wealthy or are more socially refined in their lives and vice versa. Very talented Christians can often feel unhappy that people that would be considered mediocre or very average in their talents are considered equal parts of the church or serving and vice versa. Socially polished Christians can feel uncomfortable that believers who are socially awkward or live in the margins are a part of what's going on and vice versa. But we need to stop and think, church. Do, any, do we realize how worthless our talents and our accomplishments are when it mattered? Honestly, do we realize how trivial they are in front of our God? They couldn't justify us before us. They couldn't make us right before him. No, there's only one kind of person, a sinner who is hopeless and dead in his midst. If we could have saved ourselves by our accomplishments or our works or our merit or our beauty, God would have let us do it, but we couldn't do it. And so he sent Jesus Christ to save us so everything else is worthless in comparison. Worthless in comparison to people, of other faces, of other categories. Do they have a place at your table? Do they have a place card? Do you eat with them? What about place? 
For some of us, we like to think the place that we are in life or the group we identify with because of our position in life is what makes us better or more accomplished or more deserving. This is oftentimes referred to as sectarianism, this overabundance of love for my group or uh, the sect that I'm a part of. And this shows up in all sorts of ways. It even shows up with our denominations and our church affiliations, uh, limiting the unity that we can have because we want to feel better than those of other church traditions and backgrounds. It's extremely easy for us to distress our distinctions or what makes us different in order to demonstrate to ourselves and everyone else around that we're just a little bit better of a church. It shows up in our political party affiliation or persuasion, causing us to villainize those who vote differently than us or who exist on the other end of the spectrum. We've seen all sorts of that all over social media this week, haven't we? More subtly, it shows up in, in these small factions or tribes that are built on preference or opinions, and those run the gamut from one far end of social issues like the NFL saga of those who are connected to military-affiliated families being mad at those who are kneeling during the anthem and vice versa, all the way down to small church factions where we argue and debate church worship styles and small doctrinal issues. Now please hear me on all this. I'm not saying that Christians can't have disputable views on certain issues. We absolutely can. But we have to always remember that these are secondary issues that when we are overly zealous about them, when we have fiery passion for such things, boast in such things, when we're arrogant about such things, when we create division over such things, we have placed them above our identity and our acceptance in Christ and Christ alone. It's for that very reason Paul will say in Galatians chapter 6, may I boast in nothing except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So do you, do you allow for people of other places in life to be at your table? Do they have a name card? Do you eat with them? a fellowship with him. How about grace? How about grace? This is often the fact that when we feel like we've lived a pretty moral and good religious life that has avoided certain shameful or messy sins that we're just a little bit better. We have a sense of pride because we've lived a good life. We've never been in prison. We've never gotten fired from a job. I I didn't get pregnant before I was married or have an abortion. I I came from a good family whose parents never got divorced. And so now I feel just a little bit more Uh, distinctive. I I feel superior of those who have gone through those things, aka I feel like I just need a little bit less of God's grace than they did. And some of us allow this to be our benchmark for acceptance. I've literally heard parents not wanting their child to date or marry someone whose parents got a divorce because you know, well, that just runs in the family. Or multiple times I've had to fight and had arguments in the church where people didn't want certain individuals with a past to serve in ministry areas because, well, they're just messy. As I've said before, friend, do you not get the gospel? I just said this a month ago. Do you not get the gospel? In Christ, there are not good people and bad people. There's not acceptable people and unacceptable people. There's not winners and losers, people who have it all together and dysfunctional people. There's only one type of person in front of God. A bad, dead, sin-sick rebel without any hope in the world. And only through Christ Jesus and only through the grace God has bestowed upon us do I have a hope and a future. I've needed just as much grace as anyone else I want to feel superior than. So do people that you think have needed more grace than you, do they have a place at your table? Do they, do they have a name card? Do you eat with them? Four categories. Oftentimes they're the dividing mark of who we will and will not eat with who we will spend our time with, even subtly. Church, (laughs) the gospel, the gospel gives us the freedom to unite. That Jesus is love, his grace, his freedom, his life is for everyone. Let me say it loud and let me say it clear. The kingdom of God does not struggle with the economics of scarcity. Thus, we should be fighting to bring more people, getting more seats to the table of God, rather than looking to eat elsewhere. There are no more outsiders to God's love. That is great news. So let me just end here. A couple of things that I think takeaways that we can walk away with this morning. For some of you this morning, you needed to hear this message. You felt like an outsider. You felt like you're not worthy enough to come to Christ. You've not been baptized. You've not accepted him because you didn't think you're good enough. I hear it all the time. Well, once I figure this thing out in my life, then I'll come to Christ. I want to say, friend, do you not understand? Nothing could be further from the truth. 
Coming to Christ is waving the white flag that I can't do enough and that I need him. And then it's through Christ in me. I've been crucified with Christ. It's through Christ in me and the Holy Spirit working through me that I begin to change. I get acceptance first and then transformation happens, not vice versa. There is a place for you at the table. Don't wait any longer. Don't wait another day. Don't think you're not good enough. God loves you. He sent his son to the cross for you. He wants you to know you've got a place card at his table. He wants to love you. He wants to call you a son or daughter. He wants you in his family. And for others of us, and I say us, myself included, we need to look in the mirror and realize it's time to wake up. It's time to repent of our sin of pride, of arrogance, of living out another gospel. Many of us need to seek reconciliation with some brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of us, man, we need to, to have some tough conversations and start making some room in our lives so that we can eat with and, and spend time with people who don't look and don't act like us. Some of us, this is going to mean literally grabbing a brother and sister in Christ this morning and not letting them leave. Some of it means you're going to be grabbing a brother and sister Christ who you've kind of pushed away because they don't look or act like you and you say, hey, why don't you come to lunch with me today? I want to get to know you. Some of it, it's going to be going home and having a tough conversation with your spouse about how you can flip your life upside down so that you can be more readily available to show Christ's love to anyone and everyone. But let us not waste another moment living in sin. The gospel is for everyone, redemption. Let's fight for unity. Let's fight to include people at the table of God rather than barring them away from it because there's only one gospel and that gospel is for everyone. There is no other gospel. Let's not pretend there is one with the way we live our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that 2,000 years ago, despite the fact that we were messy, despite the fact that we were sinners, despite the fact that we had done nothing to deserve your love, you went to the cross and you died for us. And yet, for some reason, at times, we want to act like we're better than. Sometimes we want to act like we have it all together. We want to act like we've done something to earn that love and we haven't. And so, God, I just pray that we would be a church who would not bar people from your table, we would not be one that is not eating with people who look differently than us or who act differently than us, but God, that we would fight to allow everyone to come to your table because we know that it's only through you and by your grace that we are saved. God, may we be a church that sets a place card for everyone of every race, every face, every place, and every grace. That is my prayer. We pray this in your name. Amen.